that Germany might face the consequences of her orgy of borrowing, and that Germany could not pay the standard doors payment of 2.5 billion marks a year, which was required in the fifth and following years of the doors plan. In addition, France, which had been forced to pay for the reconstruction of her devastated areas in the period 1919 to 1926, uh, could not afford to wait for a generation or more for Germany to repay the cost of this reconstruction through reparations payment. France hoped to obtain a larger immediate income by commercializing some of Germany's reparations obligations. Until this point, all the reparations obligations were owed to government. By selling bonds, backed by Germans' promise to pay reparations, or cash to private investors, France could re reduce the debt she had incurred for reconstruction and could prevent Britain and Germany from making further reductions in the reparations obligations, since debt to private persons <clears throat> would be less likely to be repudiated than obligations between governments. <clears throat> Britain, which had funded her war debts to the United States at $4.6 billion in 1923, was quite prepared to reduce German reparations to the amount necessary to meet the payments on this war debt. Uh, France, which had war debts of $4 billion, as well as reconstruction expenses, helped to commercialize the cost of the latter in order to obtain British support in refusing to reduce reparations below the total of both items. The problem was how to obtain German and British permission to commercialize part of the reparation. In order to obtain this permission, France made a gross error in tactics. She promised to evacuate all of the Rhineland in 1930, five years before the date fixed in the Treaty of Versailles, in return for permission to commercialize part of the reparations payment. This deal was embodied in the Young Plan, named after the American Owen D. Young, a Morgan agent, who served as chairman of the committee which drew up the new agreement. February to June 1929. Twenty governments signed these agreements on, in January 1930. The agreement with Germany provided for reparations to be paid for 59 years at rates rising from 1.7 billion marks in 1931 to a peak of 2.4 billion marks in 1966 and then declining to less than a billion marks in 1988. The earmarked sources of funds in Germany were abolished except for 660 million marks a year, which could be commercialized, and all protection of Germany's foreign exchange position was ended by placing the responsibility for transferring reparations from marks to foreign currency squarely on Germany. To assist in this task, a new private bank called the Bank of International Settlement was established in Switzerland at Basel, owned by the chief central banks of the world and holding accounts for each of them. The Bank for International Settlements was to serve as a central banker's bank and allow international payments to be made by merely shifting credits from one country's account to another on the books of the bank. The Young Plan, which was to have been a final settlement of the reparations question, lasted for less than 18 months. The crash of the New York stock market in October 1929 marked the end of the decade of reconstruction and opened a decade of destruction between the two wars. The crash ended the American loans to Germany and thus cut off the flow of foreign exchange, which made it possible for Germany to appear as if it were paying reparations. In seven years, 1924 to 1931, the debt of the German federal government went up 6.6 .6 billion marks, while the debt of German local governments went up 11.6 billion marks. Germany's net foreign debt 
both public and private, was increased in the same period by 18.6 billion marks, exclusive of reparations. Germany could pay reparations only so long as her debts continued to grow because only by increasing debts could the necessary foreign exchange be obtained. Such foreign loans almost ceased in 1930, and by 1931 Germans and others had begun a flight from the mark, selling this currency for other monies in which they had greater confidence. <clears throat> This created a drain on the German gold reserve. As the gold reserve dwindled, the volume of money uh, and credit erected on that reserve had to be reduced by raising the interest rate. Prices fell because of the reduced supply of money and the reduced demand, so that it became almost impossible for the banks to sell collateral and other properties in order to obtain funds to meet growing demand for money. At this point, in April 1931, Germany announced a customs union with Austria. France protested that such a union was illegal under the Treaty of Saint-Germain, <coughs> by which Austria had promised to maintain its independence from Germany. Uh, the dispute was referred to the World Court, but in the meantime the French, to discourage such attempts at Union, recalled French funds from both Austria and Germany. Both countries were vulnerable. On May 8, 1931, the largest Austrian bank, the Credit Anstalt, a Rothschild institution with extensive interest almost control in 70% of Austria's industry, announced that it had lost uh, 140 million shilling, about 20 million dollars. The true loss was over a billion shilling, and the bank had really been insolvent for years. The Rothschilds and the Austrian government gave the Credit Anstalt 160 million to cover the loss, but public confidence had been destroyed. A run began on the bank. To meet this, run, the Austrian banks called in all the funds they had in German banks, the German banks began to collapse. These latter began to call in all their funds in London. The London banks began to fall and gold flowed outward. On September 21st, England was forced off the gold standard. During the crisis, this crisis, the Reichstag the Reichsbank lost 2 million marks of its gold reserve and foreign exchange in the first week of June and about a billion marks in the second week of June. The discount rate was raised step by step to 15% without stopping the loss of reserves but destroying the activities of the German industrial system almost completely. Germany begged for relief on her reparations payments, but her creditors were reluctant to act unless they obtained similar relief on their war debt payments to the United States. The United States had an understandable reluctance to become the end of a chain of repudiation and insisted that there was no connection between war debt and reparations, which was true, and that the European countries should be able to pay war debt if they could find money for armaments, which was not true. When Secretary of the Treasury Mellon, who was in Europe, reported to President Hoover that unless relief was given to Germany, immediately on her public obligation, the whole financial system of the country would collapse with very great loss to holders of private claims against Germany, the President suggested a moratorium on intergovernmental debts for one year. Specifically, America offered to postpone all payments owed to it for the year following July 1st, 1931, if its debtors would extend the same privilege to their debtors. Acceptance of this plan by the many nations concerned was delayed until the middle of July by French efforts to protect uh, the payment on commercialized reparations and to secure political concessions in return for accepting the moratorium. 
it sought a renunciation of the Austro-German Customs Union, suspension of building on the second pocket battleship, uh, acceptance by Germany of her eastern frontiers, and restrictions on training of, quote, private military organizations in Germany. These demands were rejected by the United States, Britain and Germany, but during the delay the German crisis became more acute. The Reichsbank had its worst run on July 7th. On the following day, the North German Wool Company failed with a loss of 200 million marks. This pulled down the Schroeder Bank with a loss of 24 million marks to the city of Bremen, where its office was, and the Darmstadter Bank, one of the Germany's big four banks, which lost 20 million in the Wool Company. Except for a credit of 400 million ma marks from the Bank of International Settlements and a standstill agreement to renew all short-term debts as they came due, Germany obtained little assistance. Several committees of international bankers discussed the problem, but the crisis became worse and spread to London. By November 1931, all the European powers except France and her supporters were determined to end reparations. At the Lausanne Conference of June 1932, German reparations were cut to a total of only 3 billion marks, but the agreement was never ratified because of the refusal of the United States Congress to cut war debt equally drastically. Technically, this meant that the Young Plan was still in force, but no real effort was made to restore it, and in 1933, Hitler repudiated all reparations. By that date, reparations, which had poisoned international relations for so many years, were being swallowed up in other, more terrible problems. Before we turn to the background of these problems, we should say a few words about the question of how much was paid in reparations, or if any reparations were ever paid at all. The question arose because of a dispute regarding the value of the reparations paid before the Dawes Plan of 1924. From 1924 to 1931, the Germans paid about 10.5 billion marks. For the period before 1924, the, Germans, the German estimate of reparations paid is 56.577 billion marks, while the Allied estimate is 10.426 billion. Since the German estimate covers everything that could possibly be put in, including the value of the naval vessels they themselves scuffled in 1918, it cannot be accepted. A fair estimate would be about 30 billion marks for the period before 1924, or about 40 billion marks for reparations to the hell. It is sometimes argued that the Germans really paid nothing on reparations, since they borrowed abroad just as much as they ever paid on reparations, and that these loans were never paid. This is not quite true, since the total of foreign loans was less than 19 billion marks, while the Allies' own estimate of total reparations paid was over 21 billion marks. However, it is quite true that after 1924, Germany borrowed more than it paid in reparation, and thus the real payments on these obligations were all made before 1924. Moreover, the foreign loans which Germany borrowed could never have been made but for the existence of the reparations system, since these loans greatly strengthened Germany by rebuilding its industrial plant, the burden of reparations as a whole on Germany's economic system was very slight. 